think in the last few panels we've we've kind of come to the conclusion that it's impossible to legally launch an NFT. So, <laughs> let's, let's thanks, Stephen. Yeah, this is this is a big uh, topic with a lot to unpack. Uh, my name's Andy Lee. Uh, I'm with Foley and Lardner uh, in our New York office. I'm here with uh, my partner Pat Dougherty from our Chicago office at Foley and Lardner. We help to lead uh, the firm's national Web3 practice. Um, we also have uh, Will uh, and Gareth from Stevenson Law, a UK firm, here to give us a UK perspective, and Frank. Um, but, uh, but, but, but Dalamenti, right? Who's sitting in for his partner, Rob Donovan, who's gonna talk about some cybersecurity issues. So we've got a lot to move through. I'm gonna start talking about just some basic organizational principles um, that, that I think are very important. Some of these we've heard about already um, today, but um, I like to use an acronym uh, to try to help you remember it, e EDM, right? Um, not electronic dance music, but that might help you uh, remember it. Uh, it's, I, I think of it as entity, documentation, and marketing. So let's talk about the entity uh, first. And we've been talking about that a little bit this morning as well. It's really important to get an entity set up for a number of reasons that we've heard. It's very easy to think about these projects, especially before the, you know, the bear came into town, as just these art projects, let's get them going, get people excited, get a team involved, launch it, make some money, and worry about cleaning everything up afterwards. That creates a lot of potential problems from a liability perspective, tax issues, disputes with uh, people who may have been part of the project and feel they're a founder or whatever. It's very easy to set up an LLC or a corporation, whether you do it in Wyoming or Delaware. You can even, frankly, my preference would be do it yourself. Even if you don't want to get the lawyer involved yet, you could always amend your operating agreement afterwards. Um, it's really easy, but it gives you, uh, first of, and foremost, limited liability, right? So you're not gonna end up being on the hook for, personally, for a bunch of um, uh, liabilities that might come up. It even protects you with respect to tax issues. Um, and also important to be able to define your relationships with the people who are part of your project, whether they're employees or independent contractors, you don't have an entity that can sign contracts, and it gives you an amount of certainty with respect to who owns what, whose rights are what, who's getting compensated in what ways. So that's entity formation um, in the EDM. D, documentation. Uh, I think it's really important, and this also goes to the IP issues, right? Starting out, you wanna make sure you have this stuff buttoned up. Um, you do have some decisions to make, whether you wanna have an employee structure or a contractor structure, and there are pros and cons if you're gonna have employees you know, you have payroll obligations or withholding obligations, so having contractors might be um, uh, prefer preferable in certain ways. However, you now need to think about, well, how do we get the ownership of the, of the rights that we're planning to sell as part of our project? If you do it with a contractor, um, you're gonna have it in your written agreement. It's most likely an assignment or a license. You can have what's called a work for hire agreement as well. Under copyright law, work for hire is, is gonna be uh, really preferable for a reason I'll talk about, um, but if you're doing it with employees, anything they create for you is in the course of their employment is automatically a work for hire, even without a written agreement. And here's why it's important. Uh, well, there's a number of reasons, but one is, if it's a work for hire, the company, uh, the employer, own, is the original author and owns it from the start. So um, there's an issue under the copyright law here uh, in the US where an, an ind individual creator uh, has a five-year window at the end of starting around 35 years where they can revoke an assignment or a license of a copyright. It doesn't apply to a work made for hire. So if you think about, in the Bored Ape example, Seneca, the original artist, I don't know how they papered up their deal with her, right? But if she was an employee, Yuga Labs would own that from the, from the start. If she's a contractor who assigned her rights to, to Yuga Labs, then in theory, she, or in certain circumstances, her heirs, could revoke that assignment 35 years from now, and when you're talking about something that now is worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, that's important. It may not affect you know, your rights to the individual image, but when you talk about things like derivative rights, using it on, on, uh, on T-shirts and commercializing, doing all those types of things, a revocation of those rights would be a problem. And we're now seeing companies come in, there's a merger, right, between Bored Apes and CryptoPunks. All of a sudden, NFT projects, start, NFT projects start to sound like startups that might be able to be sold to venture capital firms. And if you don't have all this stuff buttoned up, you're gonna have, you're gonna have problems um, with that. And on the work for hire thing, I will say there's a, circ a split in the US circuits about whether the written agreement has to be done before the work is created or not. The Ninth and Seventh Circuits say it has to be done beforehand Second and first say it can be done afterwards, so you have to be careful with that. Um, 
the final point in EDM is marketing, which is, has a lot of, uh, of aspects to it, right? Your trademark is super important. We were talking about that, uh, they were talking about that earlier this morning. You wanna make sure the name you're using is available, that someone else isn't using it, it's your brand, right? And you might wanna protect it also and file your trademark. Um, so pay attention to that. Uh, don't overpromise and underdeliver. You've probably heard that three or four times already this morning. You could find yourself in a, a rug pull situation unintentionally. You might not be trying to take people's money and run away, but you might have promised a bunch of stuff and you don't make as much money as you thought or the price of ETH goes down and all of a sudden, or you don't have the time and it's much harder to do all the things you promised and you're gonna find yourself facing consumer protection lawsuits, maybe securities fraud lawsuits. Um, those are both prime areas for plaintiff's lawyers to bring class actions. It's a real problem, even if you win, it can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and then another piece in the marketing context uh, we were just talking about, if you're planning in your launch to have anything that is randomized or to have giveaways and things like that, you do need to be sensitive to gambling and uh, illegal, lot illegal lottery laws. In the US, they're, very, they're state specific and all the states are very different. The elements are generally, if there's consideration, elements of chance and a prize, you have some issues to think about, but it does differ by state. So you have to be careful with that. So that's my EDM sort of basic setup. And uh, I think we're gonna let Will go next to give us the UK perspective and some more project basics. Yes, thank you, Andy. Um, so the US scares the hell out of me. And uh, I had that impression before coming and these talks have done nothing to reassure me that it is, this is a difficult place um, to do stuff in this space. Um, and thank God we have lawyers like Andy uh, to help with that. Um, in the UK, um, so we advise on a lot of creator side projects. So people who are creating NFTs and want to issue those. And Gareth is gonna speak about the securities law side of things. Side of things. Um, but I guess as we have very limited time, I just wanted to folks um, keep it quite simple. Um, and if you are getting into this space, you really need to have terms and conditions. And I know we've talked about what's going on, but just if, if that is the takeaway message from today, to make sure that you have some contractual protections and you don't just go and launch it uh, and rely on things that you've said in Discord or yeah, oral representations or things that aren't written down. Um, and you need those for two really key reasons. You need, to, you need them because you need to protect your IP. So you need to say exactly what it is that you will allow people to do with that NFT once you've sold it to them. So are, you, are they allowed to then, as we've already heard, commercialize that? So take your NFT. Are they allowed to combine that? And I'm talking here, of course, about NFTs linked to artwork. Are they allowed then to combine that into new artwork and make new images? Are they allowed to take that with another brand and, and, and do things with it that you might not have thought about when you created that thing? So setting out really explicitly what it is that you're comfortable with people doing with it, and if they then make money from it, if you want some of that, or if you're happy for them to keep it all, if there are certain thresholds, like above 100,000, 200,000, that you want some of that. So that's one really key thing, thinking about the IP. We've talked about assignment, that sort of thing. So, but that, that's just the one point I want to make. And then the next thing, of course, is protecting you against liability. So we're starting to see the first claims coming in against issuers uh, for mis-selling or when, when drops haven't gone to plan. So, uh, so for example, it's like a 10,000 drop and actually only 3,000 have been sold and, those, and then after that, the community loses interest and abandons the project. People then have tried to come after the issuer saying that uh, you know, the price has completely dropped out of this now, I want my money back, um, you, know, you misrepresented this, this is gonna be successful, this is gonna be a great investment for me, all of that. And so having some very clear terms that you've drafted to rely on and say, look, we were very clear about the risks involved with this. This is an art project. You weren't supposed to buy it as a speculative investment to try and make money from it. It's because you like the art and that sort of thing. Um, that's really, really key and ultimately could save you. So those are two, two key things to think about from that perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other stuff I could say around data that you need to think about, but that's not very exciting. Uh, and ultimately, uh, sorry, a big shout out to all the data lawyers in the house. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the other, the, the final point I want to make um, then is you've now created those terms and conditions. You then need to think about something called privity of contract and whether those terms and conditions will be binding on the person that ultimately has your NFT. Again, this is a bigger of an issue in the US uh, than it is in England, because actually in England, we have something called the Contract Rights of Third Party Act, which means that if you're not the initial contracting party, you can, provided you derive benefit from that thing, you can actually enforce rights under it. Um, but something really key to think about that we always advise our clients on is don't rely on terms and conditions on your website or wherever it is that you're selling the NFTs. Actually make sure that you link to them in the metadata of the smart contract. 
don't put them in the smart contract because that means you can't, first of all, it ruins your smart contract, <laughs> big smart contract. Um, but uh, it, it reduces flexibility. So if you ever need to update them or make changes, you can't do that. But embedding them that way, it will follow the token. Um, and again, it's an extra way of saying, like, look, we did everything that we could to be very explicit about what it was that you were buying and what rights you had and that sort of thing. So um, I'm happy to leave it there if that's okay. That was just a, a couple of things. So I'll pass over now to Gareth. Me. Big G. Hi. Okay, take it. So I'm coming at this space from the regulatory angle. As a regulatory angle, it appears to me that my job is mainly to terrify clients first and then to calm them down slowly over a period of time. I get to use scary words like securities, laws, money laundering, IP, you know, and really gambling. It's dead easy to scare clients. It's phenomenal. Um, and <laughs> rightly so, frankly, because if you're setting up in the US, it is already mind-blowingly complex. And weaving your way through the regulatory arena is, is terrifying, and I, and I can really believe that. But you forget, your NFTs are borderless. Your NFTs are going everywhere. The UK's securities laws, there are hundreds of them. The main one, of which there are still many more, is MIFID. There are 1.6 million paragraphs of text that make up MIFID. I thought you said we were going to try and be uplifting after no. that. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the key takeaways from this? I want to keep it quite simple, and I want to keep it really... I want to go into as much detail as I can because I don't have a lot of time. Let's look at KYC and AML briefly because I think that's the key one. If you're in this space, let's assume you're not issuing a security token, which in the UK is actually a little bit easier to test than in the US because there's not that subjective element to the test. So let's look at KYC and AML, because that's really the first thing that's going to bite on most projects. What's KYC and AML stand for? Know your customer and anti-money laundering. So those rules are going to bite mainly in the EU, mainly in the UK, and they require you to know who you're selling your products to if you fall within those rules. And you can easily fall within those rules. And increasingly so, those rules will bring NFTs into them. Now, the key point to note is that I see, and I'm going to make a bold prediction, the centralization of Web3 slowly take over. You've got eBay buying NFT marketplaces now. They are going to raise the bar on compliance, and that is going to make other projects, smaller projects, need to meet that standard because the regulators are going to jump on that. They're going to see eBay doing that well. And so what the question is is, do we really need to KYC all our clients? Do we really need to get identity documents for all of them before we can sell them an NFT? The answer no is no, but I think over time that might start to change. And so you really need to have your eye on that prize because ultimately it's a big risk if you don't. The regulatory tide is rising sadly and it's not, it's not going to get any easier. And our job and the job of many product providers out there is to help make that a turnkey solution. You're going to need policies and procedures for an NFT project that basically show that you've implemented a KYC framework. How do we take our data from, our, from the people we sell it to, from the data that we sell our NFTs to? Have we got identity documents so that we, we know where they are? Have we sold our NFT in a sanctioned country? That's the sort of thing that we need to be mindful of. Someone should build that, Gareth. They should, and, and I, I'm working on it. <laughs> are you? Okay, <laughs> how interesting. But, um, but yeah, for sure, that's the sort of thing that, that really you need to be worried about for, for now, mostly. Securities laws angles are going to be terrifying, no matter whether you, where you're in the US, whether you're in the UK or Europe, and that's where you need to start getting advice, but where you're just, where there's no, nothing beyond real utility, I'm less worried about that for now, but the regulatory tide is rising, that's the key message from me. Um, and I'm sure Pat will no doubt tell you that the US is the same. Gareth is also available for children's parties, if anyone needs uh, an entertainer. Uh, uh, Pat Doherty uh, from Chicago. I am uh, uh, Andy's colleague, and uh, Andy is our uh, NFT maven, without a doubt. I practice in the broader Web3 space with a focus on uh, fungible tokens, but have also done some NFT work as well. And uh, I've lectured on this uh, at two law schools in Chicago, and starting this fall, I'll be uh, in residence at Cornell Law School. Uh, so I take an academic interest in it as well. 
uh, I am a securities lawyer by training. I'm going to try to give you five pieces of guidance. This is not SEC guidance. <laughs> the SEC doesn't offer guidance. They just investigate and sue people. Um, but uh, it's an ex-SEC lawyer's guidance. And I'm going to try to frame it in uh, helpful ways so that you can craft NFTs that uh, do fit within the laws and that do not lead to claims and investigations and such. Um, so five digestible bites, of which the first is that your NFT really needs to be non-fungible. <laughs> uh, here we get into the so-called fractionalization issue, and I won't go there because it's been beaten to death, but uh, I will say this, if it's a fraction of a token, it likely is a security, or it's, if other elements are present, it probably is. So, but, there are, but here's my point. There are ways to segment an asset that are, do not fractionalize it. So that's what you want to think about. If I want to sell something that looks very much like something else, which looks very much like 10,000 others, there are ways to segment it that do not fractionalize it and that yield a non-fungible token. It's uniqueness that you're after. So that's a quality, uniqueness of each token. The second point is better that it's a thing than an experience. And I'm not saying experiences can't be tokenized. I think they can, but it's harder. Uh, things are hard assets. Hard assets probably are not securities. And again, you can make it into a security if you stumble and fall, but it's easier to stay clear and clean under the law if it's a thing as opposed to an experience. The third point, better if it's an existing thing or an existing experience or a near-term experience than one that's planned out there in the future some, at some distance. And if it does not exist today, let it at least be in process and let it be fully funded so that we know with a very high degree of confidence that it will exist in the very near future. By a very near future, I mean weeks, months. I don't mean a year, I don't even mean six months. So let it be existing rather than planned. The fourth point is, this is about consumption as opposed to resale. You're selling, if you're selling NFTs, you're selling exclusivity, either you're, you're selling the right to exclude other people from an asset or from an experience. And that's how you have to market and sell it. You don't market and sell it by saying, hey, buy this because some other dude will take it off your hands five minutes later on an exchange at a higher price. And, and by the way, that may be true, but you can't sell it that way. Um, my fifth and final point is um, that if you want holders to get some kind of reward, that's very, that's problematic. And people on panels earlier than me talked about this, what they said about dividends, that's all correct. Dividends are almost always fatal. But in a helpful sort of way, let me tell you that if they're going to get some kind of reward, let them earn it. They should not get a reward just for sitting there holding a token. Let them actually have to do something to earn it. And that in itself won't get you all the home, uh, home free either, but it helps a lot. It's one of the things to take into account. So, so that's my advice. Let your token be unique for each holder. Let it be a thing rather than an experience. Let it be an existence rather than the future. Gear it toward consumption rather than resale. And if there's any reward to be had, let it be an earned reward. Those are my thoughts. I hope they're helpful. Uh, hey, everyone. Frank Badalamenti from PwC. I am not Rob Donovan up there on the screen. I'm filling in for my colleague. Um, a lot of great points made uh, on this panel. I just kind of want to round things out in the remaining four minutes that we have. Uh, just a few thoughts here on the uh, financial crime and um, uh, cybersecurity side of things. So just to reiterate on some of the comments made around AML, KYC, so um, 
you know, at, at least one of the prominent NFT ecosystems and creators recently mandated KYC on a metaverse land sale that they issued, um, uh, presumably in anticipation of not knowing how the regulators and the tax authorities are going to treat virtual land sales in the future. So, um, you know, there's definitely some, um, you know, a lot of buzz around that, you know, a lot of haters and, and fans at the same time of that process, including I think some people are trying to sell KYC on the secondary market, which is a way of circumventing that. But, um, you know, just in, in light of some of the recent enforcement actions around, um, you know, an employee of an NFT marketplace uh, being charged with uh, wire fraud and money laundering for allegedly, you know, front running or insider trading on information as to which NFTs we're going to be listed on the platform. Um, it's clearly highlighting the risk of dealing with anonymous or pseudo-anonymous, you know, actors or, or wallet address holders, and uh, you know can present risks for the marketplaces, also for the NFT um, projects themselves. And so, you know, we will likely see more around requirements for KYC and even to some extent uh, transaction monitoring. You know, using blockchain forensic tools to understand. Uh, what are your top holders doing, right? You know, some NFT projects may have a few holders that hold a material uh, amount of the supply and could potentially uh, manipulate the price. You know, there's definitely been, you know, through, through blockchain forensic kind of research, you know, there are definitely cases through inferences and what have you that there is wash trading going on, self-dealing, right? people effectively selling NFTs to themselves, to another wallet that they control, potentially in the effort to manipulate the price or the floor or the ceiling up or down, depending on what they want to do. And so if you are an NFT platform or an NFT project you know, operator, you may want to get some intelligence on what is going on with your top holders and the transactions happening, you know, not only on the primary mint, but also on secondary. And then the, the last thing I want to touch on is around um, cybersecurity. So, um, you know, w one thing that, that we would advocate, you know, is sort of if, if, you're, if you're in this space as a, as, a, uh, as a marketplace or affiliated with a project, just having a, a plan or a playbook on how you're going to respond when these adverse things do happen. You know, uh, clearly social media is being used as a way to um, socially engineer folks into clicking on links that contain malware that can drain wallets, or even just socially engineering folks to um, perhaps um, send their token somewhere just inadvertently, you know, under the guise of it being something else like customer support or giving access to their private keys and things like that. So, you know, these platforms like uh, Discord, Telegram, um, you know, WhatsApp, um, et cetera, that are, that are commonly used for communities. You know, uh, how, you know they've, they've been known to have administrator accounts taken over, uh, impersonation attacks, things like that. So th there is some technology being developed kind of in, in the startup world to, um, you know, potentially uh, mitigate the risk of these social media account takeovers and, and, and social engineering attacks. But just, you know, there needs to be some vigilance on what to do in these scenarios. And are you going to make a holder whole if their NFT gets stolen, you know, either because they were socially engineered or because the project, the smart contract itself was attacked? And also, if there's an operational failure, you know, there was an NFT project where tens of millions of dollars from the mint were trapped in the contract forever are you going to make your holders whole or reimburse them in those kinds of situations? So just having that playbook. Hey, thanks guys. Um, you know, we have some extra time and again, we're really excited to hear from the community and also to find out who we're dealing with. So are there any questions? Yes. Right. So the question is, uh, eBay entering the market, the, the thought was that it's going to raise the bar in terms of regulatory compliance and then cause everyone else to have to raise the bar. So what's that based on? 
the regulators don't need that much incentive to try and make this a more regulated space. And if they see that centralized companies are coming into it and are willing to comply in order to meet their own risk frameworks that they've got in place, eBay has a, you know, a reputation risk in this space. So they're going to want to comply as much as they can and the regulators will work with them, probably the industry more widely, to push that change through. So I would say it's both. It's probably upward and downward pressure, but, but the pressure will ultimately change and make, make the regulations more robust probably. Do you think there's any chance of uh, you know, streamlining this? You know, we've heard all day about all the problems and it, it starts to fa seem impossible to do anything. So is there any chance that, that we'll, we'll you know, have initiatives to streamline? The I, I hate to use this as a chance to plug, but I am I'm literally building right now a product that will help projects comply with money laundering without too much thought turn on and play. Here is a whole suite of policies and procedures that you can just follow. 90% of applications to the FCA in the UK for a crypto license got rejected last year, and every one of those was because there was an immature KYC framework in place. My job is to make that the opposite. You, you can buy a framework. Here it is. Go. Run with it. It's easy to operate and it's easy to manage, and that is the kind of solution that will help projects all over the world to comply with the relevant regs. So market opportunity for somebody who wants to create a good platform. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, yes, please. So the, the question, I, I, th I couldn't entirely hear you. Um, I think you're talking about when you're bringing someone on not as an employee, how do you accomplish getting the rights? So definitely get it in writing. You can have uh, a work for hire agreement. In the employee context, the fact of being an employee covers it. In the non-employee context, you, can have a, you need to have a written work for hire agreement. Um, typically, those agreements, they specify that it's a work for hire, they cite the copyright law, and then they say if, there's, if for any reason this turns out not to be a work for hire, you're, you hereby assign to us all rights, in which case it would be an assignment. As I mentioned, there, the law is unsettled in the US as to whether that agreement needs to be written and signed before the creation or whether it can be after. Um, and you know, if you end up in the assignment, uh, the assignment world, as I said, there is this this provision in the copyright law from 1976, it applies to post-1978 works, where an individual creator can revoke an assignment or a license during a five-year window at the end of 35 years, and their heirs can do it too. So again, that's a long time away, but when you're talking about immutable assets on the blockchain that have significant value, I imagine these things will still be around, and people may still care about them after 35 years. So it could change you know, what you can do with it if someone were to trigger that right. So work for hire, in my opinion, is uh, an important goal. Yeah, so if I could just add that. Okay, so the, I think the simple answer to that is when you engage someone to create art for you, make sure you have a contract with them that clearly says that they will assign all of that to you uh, and that you're allowed to use it for an indefinite period of time and all that sort of thing. That just solves all your problems. Um, that's easy to do. It's all very theoretical. There's no guidance on this. There's no case law. Well, uh, there, there are, um, well there's, a, there's a test, so... Uh, yeah, there, there are very... Howie. Yes, there are, sure. As the gentleman said, the Howey test, but that's uh, uh, very theoretical, and we, uh, nothing specific to this. Uh, but the reason uh, that physical is better is because it's in the here and now, and experience has to be created. If it has to be created, then you might be relying on someone else to create it. And if you're relying on someone else to create it, you might be, the, the transaction might be a security. Also, and, the also, and the further out in the future, and the less likely it is to occur without, 
particularly if the token's being sold to create working capital to make it possible, yeah. then, then, then it's harder. Okay, so like I said, these are motifs, these are guidelines, it's not hard and fast rules. It's possible to do an experience-based NFT, but it's more challenging. I'm trying to give you ideas about how to, how to do it easily and stay out of trouble. Okay, one last question. Go ahead. Uh, let me speak to that. Absolutely, it carves them out completely. I mean, it says that NFTs are not covered by the bill, and uh, uh, I think that's you know, very useful. Uh, <laughs> Right. Uh, yes, yeah, you should be commenting and say you like the NFT exclusion very much. Yeah. <laughs> but one, one, one added point there, we're, you know, we're talking about you, what you can and can't do. I mean, just if, if you're dealing with something that is a security, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't do it, right? You have to either register or qualify for an exemption, and there are ways to do that. It's expensive and it's complicated, but... You know, if, if you can't get around, if it's what you want to do and it's important to your vision and your project puts you in securities land, you might want to think about some of those options. And that's why you would have a DAO. There was discussion of DAOs earlier. That was all very thoughtful. But you don't need a DAO if you don't have a security, basically. So uh, a DAO is one way of managing the U.S. securities implications of a project. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one thing, one thing I think we should underscore is if, if you want any of this, any of these rules to change or if you want to influence the rules, and I think as an industry we should want to influence the rules, then get involved. Um, you know, it's your government and you can literally tell them what to do and it's easier to tell them what to do because yeah. they really don't know how this works. Uh, and the more people who explain it to them and talk about the right way to do things, the better. Yeah, and we're in New York. I would suggest contacting Senator Gillibrand's staff, especially because she is going to come under more pressure than Loomis will, I believe, uh, to broaden the scope of the bill. So if you say, no, nope, we like this, that's a great compromise, stick with it, that's a good message to send to the senator from New York. And if you are in the EU or elsewhere other than the U.S., you know, there, are, there, are, there is legislation going through EU Parliament right now, the, the MICA bill, the MICA Act, which could frankly be terrible for, for digital assets if the EU Parliament had its way. And so lobbying wherever you are is really key to making this industry survive and thrive. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. This was an absolutely amazing Thank you. panel. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.